Good evening, everyone. I'm Ajamo Baraka, and thank you again for joining uh, A Voice from the Margins. Uh, we have a very, um, hopefully very interesting uh, show tonight. I'm sure it will be. Uh, we have with us a, a very interesting, very dynamic um, a young activist, organizer, um, intellectual, uh, Danny Haifon, who's going to uh, talk with us um, about his latest uh, article and and some other issues related to issues he's been writing about for the last uh, three years. Uh, Danny is a, a social worker and a another people's journalist. We had one on last week, as you might recall. Uh, he's he's been a regular uh, contributor to uh, Black Agenda Report uh, for now about three years. Uh, he is published uh, not only in Black Agenda Report, but also uh, in the American Herald uh, Tribune, uh, Truth Out, uh, and Counterpunch. Uh, he is an active member of, of various anti-war organizations uh, and labor organizations uh, and works with the International Action Center. Danny, thank you so much for joining us this this evening. Thanks for having me, John. You know, it's really a pleasure to get a chance to talk with you because you uh, you've been quite dynamic in terms of uh, putting out your pieces, uh, very insightful pieces every uh, every week. Um, your last piece, of course, you have dealt with an issue that uh, many people are, are grappling with right now, which is uh, the whole Donald Trump phenomenon and as we get closer to this uh, inauguration, um, and and that piece for folks who would like to check it out um, is at the Black Agenda Report, blackagendareport.com. So, da Danny, uh, uh, lay out just very briefly your your main points um, in that piece. Uh, the, the 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 title of it is uh, some guidance on the Russian question. So what was your main argument well, uh, in that piece? Uh, well, the main argument to that piece was basically that right now there is a real um, problem and contradiction within the movement against Donald Trump. And what we're dealing with is a, is a pretty significant problem with <clears throat> the crisis of the two-party corporate duopoly, but more specifically the U.S. imperialist system as a whole. What's happening is that Russia is becoming the scapegoat of the Democratic Party's loss in the 2016 elections, where Donald Trump's ascendancy has basically laid bare the complete and utter failure of the two-party system to provide anything for working class and oppressed people other than oppression, austerity, endless war. And what I try to do in this article is go over some, um, some key points about uh, you know, what's going on in terms of Ru U.S.-Russian relations right now, where the Obama administration has been uh, undergoing a more than four-year campaign of, of escalating a potential World War III scenario, and how Trump's ascendancy there is this uh, dual problem for the Democratic Party and I think the entire ruling class where um, not only does his domestic policies and what he's promoting in terms of his rhetoric um, uh, seek to instigate more domestic instability, but what we're going to see is that Donald Trump's, uh, even his, just his thought of making and solidifying more peaceful relations with Russia is ultimately anathema to the interests of the finance, financial oligarchy, as well as the military industrial complex in the United States. So what I try to do is uh, basically go over, you know, some history of Russia, you know, what happened after the Soviet Union, how it became dismantled and completely and utterly impoverished by a U.S.-backed dictatorship, and how, you know, the rise of Putin and the current uh, party uh, and the current rule in the Russian Federation has moved away from the United States in many key areas, and and that's a big problem when it comes to um, a lot of interests in, in that region as a whole. You know, Danny, you are your, your your piece does in fact lay out very clearly some uh, serious analysis of the various social forces involved <laughs> in in the the intra bourgeois struggle, if you will, uh, regarding um, Donald Trump. 
uh, and you deal with the evolution of, of the Soviet Union or the collapse of the Soviet Union and some of the reasons. But what, what I find interesting is that even in how you are attempting to try to contextualize this question of Trump uh, and the Russians, um, in the current environment, even that uh, modest attempt uh, has the result of you being uh, labeled as some type of uh, pro-Russian or pro-Putin kind of apologist. Uh, and this is a very dangerous um, environment right now. And some of the driving forces for uh, framing these kinds of, of, of conversations in this way happen to be uh, the Democrats. Talk a little bit more about uh, the kind of social forces uh, that have coalesced around the Democratic Party that's responsible for uh, for this reframing. And is it really just about Russia or is it more, uh, are there other issues in play here regarding uh, why it appears that the entire ruling class has mobilized against against Trump? Yeah, I think what, what's ended up happening is that the ruling class has coalesced around the Democratic Party as the most legitimate party of the imperialist system. What happened in the 2016 elections was really striking, where Donald Trump basically uh, won the election without broad support within his own party, but also without uh, much support from the ruling class establishment other than a few business buddies, which we now see are occupying his cabinet. What, what, is, what is striking about this moment, and I think I think what we should all really take into account is how Wall Street, the military industrial complex, and, and basically the whole bourgeoisie, as we may you know, call it, that rules over the imperialist system right now, has deep issues with Donald Trump. And I think it's, it's multifaceted in why. Uh, you know, some, some people don't want to acknowledge this because Trump happens to be a megalomaniac billionaire capitalist, and we should always recognize that. However, um, one of the things about Trump that is very um, unsavory to the ruling establishment is that unlike Obama, unlike the Obama administration, which was able to basically push through and, um, and attack um, with, with very harsh policies and basically uh, escalate everything that Bush uh, left him, Trump is is not such a character. He is he he is someone who is unable to kind of rein in his own uncontrollable and unpredictable political orientation. And not only this, he's seeking to make money in Russia, and he wants to deepen relations with the Russian Federation purely on the basis of his own self interest. And we have to understand that. Russia right now is being scapegoated because the Democratic Party ultimately has no other solutions. It cannot offer anything to working class and oppressed people. So it has used Russia in its old, uh, in the old uh, red baiting style Cold War rhetoric in order to basically uh, forward policies that the Obama administration, you know, in a real material way has, uh, you know, has developed, whether that's the, you know, huge NATO escalation on the Russian border, or whether that's through this new law, which basically um, gives State Department clearance to surveil and collect and store, you know, uh, you know, information that is critical of Washington, and, and that you know, this really has to be analyzed. Yes. Now, Danny, you know, based on what you you're laying out in terms of of looking at the whole Trump phenomenon beyond the personality. One of the dangers of what appears to be the, the focus on the part of progressives and radicals on Trump, the person, are there political dangers involved in that? And, and if so, what, are, what might those dangers be? Uh, I, th I think the biggest danger is that the insurgency right now that we saw in the election period, but also since 20. 14, arguably, with the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, what is dangerous about it is that right now the Democratic Party is a really vulnerable state. Both parties are in the most vulnerable state um, that they've been in maybe in their history where, um, you know, neither, and especially the Democratic Party, which relies on putting social movements in its graveyard, it's no longer able to do that. It is calculating that Russia is its best bet for, uh, um, for channeling people's energy into 
a, a an ideology that promotes all out world war in the you know in the guise of some sort of progressive agenda against the dictatorship and i think that's really where the danger lies we have all of this insurgency right now whether it's with um just the the sheer uh, impoverishment and material conditions the racism um the endless war there are millions of people right now in uh, that showed in the elections that they do not want this and are are ready to be organized. And I think that the danger right now, the key problem is that the CIA, the Democratic Party, the military industrial complex and Wall, Wall Street are going to be pouring in millions and millions of dollars into the social movement, nonprofit industrial complex industry in order to steer this insurgency in the direction back into the Democratic Party. And and possibly start a world war in the process. Well, you know, Danny, if 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 the if they if they if they're successful in so say for example having Trump impeached, if the focus is on Donald Trump, doesn't that suggest then that the this this insurgency you referred to would then basically disappear? Yeah, I mean, there's a real danger, I think, that the insurgency, uh, if it's completely channeled into doing something like impeaching Trump, will, will disappear, that the, that the left will once again become an appendage of the Democratic Party. Right now, you know, when it came to the Sanders phenomenon, um, there was a real chance to, to make a break with the Democratic Party. And unfortunately, Sanders, of course, uh, went right back into the Democratic Party milieu, but a lot of his supporters did not. And a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people, whether it was black America, um, young people in this country, decided not to come out for Hillary Clinton, and that really hurt her. And right now, I think the Democratic Party and all of its financial backers are looking at this situation and trying to find some way to salvage their political power um, in a time where both parties have never been in worse shape um, mm. and where you have a president like Trump who has the potential to not only increase the domestic instability, whether it's through his, you know, wild calls for a wall or, you know, or um, in increasing the austerity and privatization at home, but his international policy, if he follows anything that he said in terms of his rhetoric with Syria, Russia, threatens to uh, to at least challenge in a in a in a minor way some of the uh, some of the key policies of of the imperialist uh, system right now okay so then we're going to move to uh, to the to uh, to our, our listeners and viewers um, and um, Melanie Tung has a question for you uh, do you know anything about this occupation in Poland uh, and if there is more to it they say they're going to uh, alternate the military every nine months to abide by a, a treaty, uh, but state that they're going to be there permanently. Can you speak to that, Danny? You know, I, I can't speak to it all that much. I know that NATO has really uh, built a firm presence in Poland, and I know that the primary objective of that is to, um, you know, is to increase hostilities with Russia. But on that specific question, I'm not... Um, I'm not too studied up on it. Okay, I can just I can comment on it very briefly, and we want to do this uh, fairly quickly. Uh, I think she was referring to the fact that it was reported today that there's been this military buildup in Poland, um, and as part uh, the Baltic states, I have a relationship with NATO, um, and uh, uh, according to this to to the agreement, uh, they're not going to be there aren't supposed to be any permanent troops on the border with, with Russia. But what they're doing to get around that, they're going to um, uh, circulate uh, uh, troops uh, every, uh, she says, nine months. Uh, that may be correct. Uh, but the, the, the result will be that there will be a permanent presence of NATO troops uh, on the uh, Russian border. A very, very uh, dangerous move on the part of the Obama administration. Uh, the Russians said today that they uh, consider this to be a, a provocation. So it's a very dangerous and reckless move, again, trying to uh, box in the uh, um, uh, Trump administration in terms of his, his uh, policies re regarding uh, Russia. Uh, Joanne Taylor 
uh, says that the Democrats are creating a atmosphere of fear, a uh, bad strategy on their part uh, again. Well, I would uh, probably uh, agree, agree with that. Um, Michael uh, Raymond asks if there's a Green Party presence in Russia. I really don't know that. Maybe someone uh, can uh, can that. That's something that I'm uh, I'm not aware of. How about you, Danny? Do you know? No, I don't know. I, I do know that the Communist Party is making a resurgence in Russia, um, given the current situation. The economic situation is very bleak, as well as mm. the political situation continues to worsen. Um, but yeah, Putin and the and the uh, United Party of Russia remains very popular. So I don't know about how. Green Party would fare right now. <laughs> okay. What is your, um, um, uh, Hernan uh, wants to know, what is your assessment of Bernie Sanders now that he has joined the anti-Russian propaganda chorus? I think my assessment is the same as it's always been. I always saw Bernie Sanders as another Democratic Party politician who ultimately cannot deviate from the war parties line. Um, and I'm not surprised that he has done this because I, I think that as much as he spoke to a lot of genuine concerns of a lot of people in the United States, um, there was also since the beginning uh, a lot of contradictions in what he wanted to do domestically and his international positions on things like Israel, on even Russia. He was very um, he was he was not hesitant to call Putin things like bully and dictator. So, I'm not surprised uh, that he that he's done this. Mm. Then, what kind of things can can be done uh, to build an effective opposition to these to these moves? I mean, we're not helpless. What are, what are, in your assessment? What should be done politically, structurally, uh, to to try to counteract these moves by uh, by the Democrats and by the Republicans? What can we do? Melody Tune asked again, what can we do to uh, to stop uh, this war, a, a potential war uh, with Russia? Well, I think it's going to take a lot of hard work, a lot of organization, organization, organization. I think that uh, right now what the primary problem is in the United States is that the crisis conditions that are happening domestically with the imperialist and capitalist system um, as well as the endless drive for war abroad, really opens up an opportunity for um, you know radical intellectuals and radical activists like ourselves to penetrate the you know the spontaneous insurgency that's really going to I think build as um, you know as Trump is unable to uh, you know, give himself cover for a lot of the policies that he will be ultimately forced to continue. I mean, part of this drive to start a world war with Russia before January 20th is also about ensuring that Trump toes the line on all of the things that he decided to deviate from in terms of policy with Russia, Syria, uh, all of this is really all of what it's about. Um, and so, you know, his domestic policy is nothing is going to be nothing to write home about, and there's going to be a lot of insurgency. So, I think what can be done is um, making sure that we are inside of these movements, trying to build leadership and develop leadership, um, continue to, um, you know, on all facets, whether it's electoral, whether it's um, at the level of organizing workplaces and schools. I think we just have to continue to fight. And struggle, and I think the objective conditions are 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 catching up. Are you? Do you think that there are uh, strategic uh, points of convergence between that, uh, the contradictions of the neoliberal order cannot be reconciled? Um, do you see some uh, points of convergence, and if so, what might those points of convergence be in terms of of, of common policies or whatever? You're right. Uh, I think that um, a lot of there were. I think Trump supporters, although you know many of them are white, many of them could be called "quote unquote" racist. I think it's too simple to just label all Trump supporters that because a lot of because the Republican Party, the GOP, has basically been the white man's party, as Glenn Ford says on Black Agenda Report, um, for many decades, and it's just now that there is this sharp break in certain policy positions such as 
war with Russia, war in Syria, um, just war in general, I think, um, is a really important platform to develop an anti-war, anti-imperialist position. And I think um, with, uh, you know, greens and, and reds and, and a, lot of radical, a lot of radicals can really try to build around that in order to also build upon the momentum that I think the Trump and Sanders phenomenon as a whole really hearkened on, which was the true and deep discontent and um, just dissatisfaction with the economic situation in the United States. I, I think the jobs report that 95% of jobs since 2006 have been part-time, the fact that there's like 6 million delinquent car loans, people are being evicted from rental homes, you know, there's just so much mass discontent around the economic situation in the United States that there is really, I think, a lot of ability to reach some of those people who voted for Trump and bring them into a real radical political agenda. D. Tang says that, um, that Russia really is a distraction, that the Democrats are not focusing on the issues. Um, we might extend that and say perhaps even some of our folks who are overly uh, focused on the Russians are not uh, seizing the moment in terms of raising or not raising, continuing to raise the critique that we raised during the campaign to push out the issues we thought were important as part of a, a transitional program, uh, issues like uh, a livable wage, uh, continuing to, to struggle for a single, single payer health care uh, system now that they are going to repeal uh, uh, so-called Obamacare, uh, continuing to struggle for uh, universal health, uh, uh, universal child care, uh, guaranteed uh, a basic income, uh, eliminating student debt, free tuition, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how important is it for us to actually uh, develop and keep focus on a set of transitional uh, demands? Is that something now that should be the priority? And if so, if so you know, what might, uh, does the basis exist for us building a, uh, a, a broad-based progressive slash radical movement um, that goes beyond just the Greens, but also incorporates other radical organizations. Is this the moment for that? I think it is exactly the moment for that. And I would actually push back on a lot of, uh, maybe a lot of people in the anti-Trump uh, insurgency right now and say that we need these transitional demands to be made on Trump because there's never been, I think, in, in, in U.S. history such an unstable uh, administration where not only are there forces within it that have competing interests, but also there is a deep divide within the ruling establishment that must be taken advantage of. And without these transitional demands, we cannot possibly sharpen the contradiction between the people and the state um, in such a way that can really begin to educate a lot of people who maybe are new to the new to politics, new to struggle. Um, who are really seeking to see some change, but maybe don't know how to bring that about. And I think the only way to do that is to really show people in reality, in um, real time, uh, you know, what that division really looks like. And I think this is, is the moment to do it. You know, um, Danny, I, I think that uh, um, many of our, of our viewers would probably agree. Uh, but I guess, I guess the quite one of the questions is what then are some of the internal issues, the internal contradictions within the progressive radical movement that is preventing us from building the kind of powerful oppositional force that we need to build here in this country? What are some of the issues that we have to deal with that are undermining our ability to build a, a real radical opposition? I mean, the list could go on. I think uh, the key one is always white supremacy and racism, which has always divided um, the working class movement in the United States with the movement for self-determination um, of black people, indigenous people, um, it, you know, and, and people oppressed by white supremacy. There also, I think, uh, that, I mean, that's always going to be a longstanding one that has to be done through, that has to be worked out through organization. And then we have 
I think a huge one, which is the Democratic Party and its nonprofit industrial complex, which has really sanitized and soiled a lot of the uh, ability to uh, insert a radical narrative and a radical ideology into the mass movements of our period. Uh, I mean, we could go on and on. Labor leadership right now is completely attached well, to the Democratic let's stay, Party let's stay and with the, the issue. aggregate. Let's stay with the issue of, of, of race and white supremacy. Because one of the things came out of the of the uh, uh, victory by Donald Trump was this sort of hang hand hand uh, uh, ringing that was taking place among Democrats and other progressives that said that, that you know the real issue uh, the real explanation for uh, Donald Trump's ascendancy was that enough wasn't done for the white working class uh, that um, you know the strategy had gone forward. And I think even Bernie Sanders sort of uh, 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 referenced this away from what they are called so-called identity politics. What, what is your assessment of, of, of that position in, in light of what you just said? It, I, you know, I think that position uh, that Sanders took is, uh, you know, I, I think it's complex. I think that, you know, my opinion um, it is true, the Democratic Party has attempted to maintain legitimacy by purely um, appealing to certain elements of leadership within, um, within the black community as well as within labor that, um, you know, that really speaks to less of a mater the material conditions of working people and more to a legit, very legitimate issues of identity and oppression among women, uh, and, and, you know, racism. And I think my, I, I think what is a problem is how these things can be disconnected, and how the 2016 elections and the Democratic Party, as well as the, um, as well as the Donald Trump phenomenon, as much as uh, you know, the 2016 elections brought out all of these material. Um, grievances of millions of people, it also showed how uh, detached right now the struggle for self-determination, um, the struggle against racism, um, the, how the language has has been penetrated by the Democratic Party uh, to the point where uh, we're talking about identity politics versus the working class. And, and I don't think those things are separate. I think that the struggle for self-determination among black people is a key and critical question to actually achieving any working class unity, but also at any working class movement in general. And I think that separation between the two has to be addressed. Um, and unfortunately, I think that Sanders and Trump are not, are not the ones who are able to do it. <laughs> so it'll be up to us. In, in our last minute, uh, uh, Danny, uh, what uh, would you leave our viewers with, our, our Green Party activists? What should the, uh, from your, your point of view, uh, what should we be attempting to focus in on, to prioritize uh, within the Green Party to build the kind of, of opposition that we, we know we have to build here uh, in this country? What would be your advice? I think I would like to leave. My advice would be to ensure that whatever political work that we are doing on the ground to organize this insurgency um, against the Trump administration, but also this insurgency that really has its roots in, in the crisis of capitalism and imperialism, that as we're doing that, we make sure to fight the Democratic Party and the ruling class, uh, ruling class's narrative behind it that is scapegoating Russia and really placing the world on the precipice of, uh, of a third world war and how dangerous that really is and how we really need to have solidarity with peoples all over the world if we're ever to actually achieve any material victory um, in our movement work at home. Uh, and I think I just like to leave people with that because there's far too few of this kind of work going on and um, we have our work cut out for us. So I hope that, um, you know, I hope that this message rings somewhat clear. It was crystal clear, um, Danny. And, and Danny, thank you so much. We have come to the end of our program. As I told you, the, the time was going to fly. Uh, we still have more questions, but of course, uh, we don't have to say that for the next time that you are able to, to join us. 
Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for um, being with me again this evening. Uh, remember that we are uh, still moving toward the uh, Occupy inauguration activities uh, in Washington. Uh, continue to uh, check the uh, uh, Facebook uh, pages, uh, in particular, uh, Joe Stein's pages, uh, and continue with the mobilization process as we uh, sharpen ourselves uh, and prepare for the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the ongoing and upcoming struggles that we have to engage in to build this party, to build our opposition, uh, and to uh, build a new world. So thank you, everyone. I'll see you again uh, next Thursday. Uh, and thank you again, Danny. Thank you, John. Thank you.